uh, Ria, and we are going to start sharing um, the spotlights in Latin America about what is going on, uh, what type of research is going on in Latin America. Um, the first person that we are going to hear about is Enrique Sucar. Enrique Sucar, and actually I want to mention my first research paper that I have ever published was with Enrique Sucar, so it's an honor to have him on this panel. So Enrique Sucar is a senior research scientist at the Instituto Nacional de Astrofisica, Optica y Electronica, el INAWE, and president of the Mexican Academy of Computing. Um, he is a member of the National Research System in Mexico, SME Level 3, so he does a lot of research. He's a member of the Mexican Academy of Science. He's a senior member of the IEEE, member of the Mexican Engineering Academy. He is the winner of the National Science Prize of 2016. Um, and so without further ado, and so some of his interests are around understanding and building intelligent systems that can interact with the real world taking the best decisions under uncertainty based on probabilistic graphical models and decision theory. Um, and then he's using this into robotics, computer vision, energy, and biomedicine. Um, the research that I did with uh, Enrique was around how we could use the remote for giving rehabilitation uh, to people who, who suffered a stroke. Um, and so now with further ado, Enrique Sukar will present a little bit about his research then we're going to hear about what others, uh, what, what other related researchers are working on. So we're really excited to have you, Enrique. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation and, and the invitation. Is, I'm very happy to be in Ria again. And uh, so I'll start uh, sharing my, my screen. So it doesn't, it doesn't let me share the screen. I don't know if you have to give me permission. Sonia, can you give him permission? Because I think that I can't. I, I don't know if, do you guys hear Antonio? Because I hear him very, very. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I think only stop sharing. I cannot hear him. I think, because I can't share my screen either. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we're too many in here. May, maybe if I leave, we have too many screens on. Might that be it, Jenny? Je Je Jennifer is, is is seeing how to how to do this, how how to change it. Um, meanwhile, maybe I'll, I'm going to present. I'll present the other researchers if, if that's okay while we solve this. Oh, now you can. Perfect. I I think I I can do it now. Uh, oops, let me see, it was in the end. <laughs> so you can see my presentation? Uh, yes. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about uh, a, in, an area, in, one of the areas in which have, I have been working, particularly in the energy area. So from uh, projects we have done applying into artificial intelligence in clean energy. Uh, this is a, an outline of, of my talk. Uh, this work is based on graphical models, so I will give a very brief introduction and then present uh, briefly three applications. Uh, one in uh, wind turbine diagnosis, other in wind, wind prediction, and finally in energy markets and I conclude uh, with some, some remarks. So basically, probabilistic graphical models uh, are techniques that allow to apply the Bayesian approach in very complex problem, taking advantage of the independencies among the variables in, this, in these domains. Uh, basically, we have a graph that defines the structure of the model and a set of local functions that defines the probabilities. And in this way, we can uh, apply these techniques to very large and complex problems. Uh, and we can learn these models from data 
and also do some different types of inference. Uh, there are several techniques that we can put on the, the umbrella of probabilistic graphical models. Uh, this includes Bayesian classifiers, Bayesian networks, hidden Markov models, dynamic Bayesian networks, Markov random fields, influence diagrams, Markov decision processes. So I'm going to uh, talk about uh, some of these in the, in the rest of the talk. So I'll start uh, with uh, uh, the first application in diagnosis. This is a very large, complex system uh, going to intervene. So we apply a technique that calls multi-sectioned Bayesian networks in which we divide a, a large system into relatively independent components. This is usually true in industrial systems, in equipment. Usually you can block it in different components. And then we, what we can do is do inference locally in each component, and then they, this interacts between their common variables. Here I show an example for a digital circuit that is divided into uh, three different parts. And then uh, below, we see the representation as a junction tree of this system, uh, where we have very few variables in the intersections. And this allows for efficient inference in a distributed manner for these large and complex systems. So we apply this to the diagnosis of uh, wind turbines. Uh, this is a very complex system, so we ca if we try to do it in a single model, it could uh, take a lot of time and be difficult to build the model. So what we did is we divide the, the system into uh, six components, as are, as are shown in this diagram, the different parts of the system, like the, the blades, the rotors, the generator, and the tower, and then have a different model, a, a probabilistic model for each uh, subcomponent, and then these are integrated in, in, into via, via this uh, distributed system. So we compare the centralized schema versus this distributed one. Uh, both approaches have the same accuracy in terms of fault detection that is quite quite good in this case, but the distributed approach is much more efficient, about uh, three times faster for learning and five times faster for fault detection. This is important because we want to detect a fault as soon as possible. So this is the first application. I'll go into the second one in which we want to do wind prediction. And actually the wind in certain location if we want to predict several hours or days in advance, we have to take into account the conditions in areas that are far away and at different times. So we develop a model that we call a special temporal graphical model that can learn which variables are relevant and in which different places and at which different times to predict a particular variable in one place and at one time. So using an optimization process based on conditional mutual information, we can find this subset of variables that are like the best ones to predict a particular one. Uh, as I was saying, we apply this to, for wind prediction in, in Mexico. This is particularly important for, for wind parks in which you want to be able to plan in advance how much energy you are going to produce the next days. Uh, and uh, we tested this approach in different places in the central area of Mexico, taking into account different uh, meteorological variables to predict uh, wind uh, speed in, part in one particular location. So we, we learn a particular model for each location. That's what, what some of the interesting parts of this work. So which variables and in which areas to use are different for each location. So we can learn the model for each particular location. This is one example in which to predict the velocity of the wind in certain location we did to include information from other locations uh, and uh, in this way have a better prediction. 
Uh, and uh, here I we summarize some of the results for, for 12 different locations in, in Mexico. Uh, and we can see that the prediction error up to 24 hours is in relatively uh, acceptable in the order of between one and three kilometers per hour. Uh, the wind speeds are usually around 20. So this is uh, an acceptable error in, in this case. And uh, then we go into the final application. And here we are using markup decision processes. This is a framework for decision making on their uncertainty, in which uh, we can uh, plan for uh, uh, controlling cer certain system or certain aspect uh, and consider the uncertainty in the actions, the utility of the plan, and obtain optimal solutions. Uh, here we are using discrete MDPs uh, that are uh, comp that have these elements. And by solving these models, we obtain an, an optimal policy that gives us the best actions to do in each state. Uh, uh, if you work in reinforcement learning, this is what actually you are uh, solving in reinforcement learning is basically solving a, an MDP by a trial and error. If you have the model of the system, you can use uh, dynamic programming. So we apply these uh, techniques to the uh, energy market, basically develop a automatic broker to uh, participate in a, in a simulated energy market, uh, it's a system called PowerTAC, in which there are different types of markets, including uh, the wholesale market, balance market, uh, and uh, the brokers compete to try to maximize profits. Uh, we, we develop a multi-agent system in which we have uh, three, three experts, one for the tariff market, another for the wholesale market, and a third one for the balance market. Uh, and these uh, agents, uh, these MDPs, learn their policies based on previous market experience uh, using the same simulator and also of uh, what other agents did. So they try to uh, take into account, let's say, the competition to get a, a, a good policy. Uh, this is a, a diagram of the system architecture in which uh, these uh, uh, experts, these uh, agents, uh, do, do bids according to the different cons uh, situation in the market and, and then they try to basically gain more customers and have more profit. We have uh, participated in an international competition that uses this power tack for a few years. And uh, well, our best result was in 2016 in which we got a silver medal, <laughs> second place. Well, to, to conclude, I, I want to present this, uh, maybe to uh, get some discussion later. I know many people are now working on deep neural networks, so I want to contrast probabilistic graphical models against deep neural networks. So graphical models basically are compact representations of probability distributions, while neural networks are fusion approximators. A, a probabilistic graphical models a, try to represent the knowledge about certain domain, in particularly dependency relations, and can incorporate prior knowledge. Neural uh, networks learn representation according to certain objective. Uh, in graphical models, usually we want to learn the structure of the domain. So we usually have a generative model. Uh, and in neural networks, learning tries to minimize a lot of functions, so they tend to be discriminative. Uh, learning and inference can be computational hard in graphical models. In, in neural networks, learning is, is complex, but inference is usually very efficient. A, a query in a graphical model represents a multilinear function, so it cannot represent any function, and while neural networks can approximate any continuous function with an arbitrary error. Uh, but uh, graphical models can be a transparent model and in some way explain the results, while 
deep neural networks tend to be black boxes, difficult to explain the model and the results. So I think there is an opportunity to combine both approaches and take advantage of the complementary strengths. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, collaborators, students, and the sponsors of these works. Uh, and finally, I give you some uh, additional uh, information, if you want, of the different applications I presented, and also uh, some work on this analysis of the difference between graphical models and deep neural networks. And if you want to know more about graphical models, well, I can, uh, you can get them from my book. <laughs> that will be all. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Enrique. Fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. Um, well, the next speaker, so I think that what we could do is that we could have like a quick session of quick questions for Enrique, um, and then we'll go off into the, to the next speaker. Um, and then we'll have general questions for everyone. Um, so we got a social media person that was asking about, um, so you, I think that you discussed um, that you were using your models for uh, predicting weather in certain locations, right? And uh, like the, the nature was, was going to be uh, behaving. So from social media, somebody is asking, uh, Pedro Alvarez is, is, is asking us about um, what do we lose from having black boxes in the cases of predicting weather? Um, because I think that you were, since you were using uh, graphical models, you would have a very transparent uh, model. But if now people want to use, uh, for instance, deep nets or uh, for, for this, where it was a black box, uh, what would they lose if they, if they started now, now do, using uh, deep nets for this type of modeling? Um, and also, I wasn't aware about your book. I'm really excited to get it. Uh, you explained things very clearly. Thank you. Yes, well, uh, I think uh, these uh, explanation capabilities, of course, they are important for some applications, but not for all. I agree in this case of, of uh, wind prediction, it's not critical to have an explanation. But uh, for instance, in the case of the, of the diagnosis, maybe the operator wants to have a, an explanation of why the system is uh, predicting certain failure. Uh, he will like to know more information. So it depends on the application. In some, ones, in some applications, it's important to have sort of interpretability. In some applications, it's not. Thank you. Um, we have, we're going to take just one more question. Uh, this is from Francisco Romero. He says, really awesome. Thanks. According with uh, probabilistic graphical models and deep neural network comparison, what are the computational differences needed to run both approaches? So here they're asking a little bit about technical details. Um, I don't know if you could talk about the technical details in implementing one versus the other. Like, do you need more infrastructure for running one? Well, uh, I can say that, uh, for instance, uh, in graphical models, usually you don't need so much data because you can even incorporate prior knowledge. Uh, but uh, uh, as I was saying, if you get a very complex model, inference can be uh, difficult. <laughs> In other words, usual inference is, is fast. Uh, and uh, if you ask more about how do you can combine them, here there are different uh, ways to combine them. No, uh, One is to, uh, we, we did one work, some work in which uh, we use a, a neural network. We were trying to get the, the pulse of a person across videos. So we use a neural network to detect the pulse in a, an image. And then we use here Marco models to get, have the dynamics of, of the pulses. And this helps to correct some errors. We get some, some more images, no? So they are, I think, different ways we can combine them and the, this could be a very, very different ways. No, it's not a single way. Excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and well, maybe now uh, we can pass to Monica uh, Tentori. I saw Jason asked a little bit about PGM uh, combining it with deep neural networks. Um, 
I have seen some papers where they do combine it. Um, we'll maybe we'll at the end we'll, we'll discuss this question in a little bit. But I want to pass now to uh, Monica. And um, so Monica Tentori is an assistant professor in the computer science uh, and department at the Center for Scientific Research and Higher ed Education, CCSE. Um, uh, where she investigates the human experience of ambiguous computing to inform the design of ambiguous environments that, effecti that effectively enhance human interactions within their world. Her research uh, intersects the HCI and ambiguous computing, focuses on designing, developing, and evaluating natural user interfaces, self-reflection capture tools, and new interaction models for ambiguous computing. Um, I want to mention that um, her, uni her, her department has been, uh, I would argue, one of the main uh, promoters of human-computer interaction in Latin America. Um, they have really helped uh, push uh, the HCI research in the region, um, so it's a real honor to have Monica um, with us. Um, Monica is a member of the Mexican Association of Human Computer Interaction. Please check out uh, what, what this what this association is. Um, the HCI community in Mexico uh, is growing. In 2017, she was one of the organizers of the SIG Chi sponsored summer school on pervasive computer interaction for binational challenges in Mexique. Uh, Mexique is also an awesome conference on human computer interaction in Mexico. Also check that conference out. Actually, she participated as a keynote speaker in um, the Latin American Congress of Human Computer Interaction. Um, and so now, without further ado, um, let's have Monica Tentori. Uh, Monica, is it possible for you to share uh, the screen? Um, and I'm really excited uh, to have you, um, Monica. I've been a big fan of her research. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sharing the screen. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Yes. Uh, for some yeah? Yeah. Okay. Let me, um, for some reason, you know, uh, the the router didn't, you know, work. So um, give me, have some patience, please. Um, bear with me for a second. Um, yeah, and so Monica and I, I are, and I are actually from the same research area. I also work in human computer interaction. Um, and so it's really great to see how much this area of human-computer interaction uh, has been growing in the region as well, and also how it's combining now much more with artificial intelligence. Um, I think that it is key for when we're thinking about having artificial intelligence in the power of people, it's very important to integrate HCI. And so it's really exciting um, to be here. Okay, great. So um, thanks for the introduction. and. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, force related uh, digital biomarkers in autism spectrum disorder. And I'm going to show you how we can use artificial intelligence in an applied, a specific healthcare scenario. Um, so, the healthcare system in Latin America is kind of unique and imposes several challenges to artificial intelligence that are interesting for us to study. Specifically, we have poor access to healthcare services, um, we have inefficient resources and inequalities in health that can lead to uh, decreased life expectancy, lower quality of life, and also, also impact economic, economic growth. Um, so there is an untapped potential of to use artificial intelligence to enhance the healthcare delivery in this Latin context. Um, and artificial intelligence has shown, uh, has, has, has grown and has shown impact in different healthcare scenarios. And one particular area that has made a compelling argument that is very strong to cope with some of the issues is the screening of the disorder. The screening is a strategy used by health authorities to enable health early intervention and to detect a potential health disorder on time. Um, but the problem is that current methods use as gold star and a standard for a screening, um, with multiple limitations, uh, they basically 
uh, include high false positives in the classification rate, or they use data that's subjected to clinicians' interpretation, and sometimes it is biased. Um, so, and also in a lot of context, we don't have enough resources. So sometimes you go into the hospital and there is no stamps uh, or imaginary that help you know to do the screening and the diagnosis. So there is an opportunity for explore a low cost of this kind of exams and power with artificial intelligence. Um, in particular, one interesting area to study this problem of screening and the use of artificial intelligence is autism. Uh, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder that impacts socialization and behavior. Um, early intervention in autism is very important. It is crucial to enable individuals to take the neuroplasticity and speed up skills development. Um, the problem is that the biological markers of autism are currently unknown. So it is very difficult to diagnose autism with a laboratory test or we don't know this kind of objective information to help the assessment of autism. Um, so as a consequence, autism diagnosis is usually delayed and it's basically based on uh, clinicians' observation and interpretation and parents have to clear red flags and sometimes they find difficult, difficult to do so. One area that can help to cope with this, this issue is the use of digital biomarkers. Digital biomarkers can quantify physiological and behavioral data and may speed up referral to an early assessment program. However, there are peer screening tools that take advantage of these digital uh, biomarkers and uh, help parents and clinicians to identify these red flags. In the past years, we have, we have been exploring or exploring how novel pervasive interactions can uncover unknown red, flag, red flags as potential de digital markers with autism. And these novel pervasive interactions can be in the form of touch smartphones or brain computer interfaces or elastic surfaces, which is the case study of what I'm saying today. Um, and the good news about these interactions is that we can capture interactions 24 seven and interactions in a everyday environment of the users. And we can learn from atypicalities in how they interact with this technology. And this has been our major uh, line of inquiry for the, for, the, for the last years. So today I'm gonna present you the results of a pilot case study, and I will show you how the force can we potentially use as a digital biomarker to to for the screening of autism. So to this aim, we developed a uh, uh, elastic surface. You are seeing it here in the video uh, to explore difficulties in the amount of force children that are being used when interacting with these elastic uh, interfaces. Um, the elastic interfaces, as you can see. Uh, enable users to play sounds when they touch, pinch, or twist the, the circle. And it has a black nebula background uh, with 3D animations of space-based elements that all together present challenges of variations of rhythm and strength to children with autism. So we asked 46 neurotypicals and 26 children with autism to complete different four games using the fabric, using different gestures like tapping, pushing, and sliding the fabric. Um, so with this information, you can see in the image that uh, we translate this uh, push or this uh, push push gesture into features and we, we extract into a vector and we extract several features related to force like velocity, acceleration, and force uh, from these uh, push movements. And we use those features to train uh, models or machine learning algorithms. Our results show that children with autism use less force, use smaller gestures, and need more time to complete a gesture. And basically, because of the type of uh, the type of way they tend to interact with with individuals and with objects in general, and um, so this is huge as you can see that there is a difference on how neurotypicals and children with autism 
will use a specific object, in this case, this elastic surface. And so with the model we use, we learned that we can discriminate between neurotypicals and children with autism with a precision, with a high precision. And we only need two minutes of interaction of the users to actually predict uh, the difference between neurotypicals and children with autism. And we also further test a model with two cases of children with autism that has not been diagnosed yet, but teachers have shared that they, these students have present red flags and, um, and they also score low, low in, the, in a model test. And um, um, so they use this, 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 our model and, and this surface and uh, our model classified them as having autism. And two of them, they are following up for their assessment for autism. So what I want you to learn from my talk or the takeaways from my talk are these major three things. First, we kind of show that force seems to be a digital biomarker of autism and technology such as elastic surface are instrumental in uncover uh, differences in the use of force with, uh, when interacting with this interface. Also, we show that novel interactions, in this case, this elastic surface, which is not available at the moment, but we think that other novel interactions or novel user interfaces can offer new opportunities for applied artificial intelligence to collect this data 24 seven and to use this data to learn of differences among the population that are using these this current interfaces. And also, I want to show that the Latin healthcare context imposes interesting challenges for applied artificial intelligence. We are different in terms of geographic, in terms of territory, in terms of uh, population and demographic, and those uh, uh, characteristics may make very interesting to explore uh, 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 this, this scenario. And in this, uh, in, in this research, we learn of three major open challenges, and I want to close with that to, you know, increase discussion. And one major challenge will be the data collection of health that is challenging and expensive. And um, you can see, you know, the data set that we're going to be using is very limited in, the, in, in terms of number of users, users, but it's very interesting that it's actually a real world data set and it is inaccurate and, and it does not have a control environment that, it, that uh, is kind of make, making this, this, this data set that is real world usage of, of data. Also, um, uh, artificial intelligence solutions have not been developed to treat the diverse healthcare needs of all Latin American citizens. So there is no um, solution that opens like one fits all things. So we need to look into personalization and perhaps personalized care. And also description of real world deployment in concrete scenarios like, like the one I show are scarce and urgently needed and there's an opportunity for us to be there. And with this I conclude and I would be happy to take questions or present for discussion. Okay, thank you very much, um, Monica. This was uh, awesome. And I'm gonna leave your slide open so that people can also uh, see a little bit about uh, what you have been um, doing. Thank you so much. So um, before we, now next we're gonna move to Antonio. Before we move to Antonio, um, let's take some quick questions from the audience. Um, so Francisco Romero asks, so cool, I wonder how do we know that one out of 54 children has autism? Uh, so that's one, his first question. And the second question is, if this approach could be used to predict other dis other types of uh, disabilities. Um, and then I'll ask you some questions that we received from social media from our, our, our viewers. Yeah, so the first question, that's a very interesting thing. So the prevalence of autism has been increasing and it's not that uh, there are more individuals, they are, there's children that born with autism, it's just we are having a better understanding of what this uh, disorder really means and we are improving in the screening methods and in the diagnostic methods and we are now uh, able to better diagnose autism. That's why the prevalence is, 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 is you know, increasing at the moment. And um, yeah, so we haven't, we don't have, you know, that uh, information of if this fabric or elastic surface can be used to 
to diagnose other neurodevelopmental neurodevelopment, disorders. But as you can see, we are talking about impairments in motor, motor functioning. And if you take into consideration individuals with cerebral palsy or even, you know, individuals with attention deficit disorder, so there's uh, association with motor development that is going to be there. And so there's, uh, uh, there's a hunch that you know force can be also affected with it, with this uh, uh, neural development disorders. I don't have the data yet, and this are one of the things that we would like to do to explore neural neural developmental disorders more in general and no particular for autism. But right now we started with autism, but but I think yeah, it could, it could be used for other populations as well. Thank you. Um, another question that we received was, uh, this is from Joaquin Navarro Perales. Um, he's asking about, uh, did only autistic girls participate in the study or only boys? Uh, was it a mix of, of both sexes? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. So there's a problem, the prevalent, there's a higher prevalence about autism in boys. So one out of five boys is a girl with autism. So it's, you know, the, our recruitment kind of showed that behavior that already is available in, in you know, in, in the autism population. So there's a problem for us to recruit because there are less girls with autism, um, but it's, it is how it's going to work in, in the real world, to be honest. Um, so yeah, it, uh, we want to, we, we, all, we always want to recruit more girls but they are difficult to find. And um, and actually, you know, I didn't present the last model because in the last model, we removed the girls because just having two cases was not enough data. And we achieved almost to 100% of accuracy. So there's an error that these cases are introducing into our model, but we think that it's, it's, it's more, you know, representative of what is, how the autism population currently are, it is. Hear you. I don't know if it's if it's me or. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was on mute. Um, so Andres Andres Campero is telling us that uh, the panel's running a little bit late in time. Um, so we're going to run go into our next uh, with our next panelist, who is Antonio. Um, so Antonio uh, is uh, he also he studied uh, chemical engineering uh, at UNAM. And then he did his PhD at uh, the University of Cambridge, where he actually won the award of the best PhD thesis of the year. Congratulations, Antonio, I did not know that. Afterwards, he worked um, at Imperial College, where he received the award of Sir William Wakeham uh, as the best investigator uh, in the postdoctoral, uh, in the postdoctoral um, um, area. Um, wh where he was working in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Afterwards, he was named a research fellow um, by the science, um, by the government of, 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 of the, by the British government um, in, in their own like, National Science Foundation. Um, so he's a research fellow by uh, the National Science Foundation of the British government. Well done, Antonio. Um, and he also has obtained um, the award of the Young Author Award by the federal, um, by the by the International Federation of Control, um, and the award of uh, Micklin uh, by the Institute of Chemical Engineers, um, and so uh, in, in the UK, he is currently um, uh, he is currently directing. Um, the lab of optimization and machine learning in um, engineering processes in the Center for Processing Systems Engineering in the Department of Engineering at Imperial College London. So um, it's a true honor to have you, Antonio. Without further ado, we'll, we'll give it to Antonio. Thanks a lot, Sai, for the super kind introduction. Um, so, sorry, I cannot share my screen, I think, because we have a maximum of five people of five, five presentations. Uh, so, so last time I was able to do it, but okay, I think I'll do this. No, I can't share my screen. 
I, I think someone has to like leave the stage just temporarily and then come up again so that I can share. I'm gonna go. Just, just temporarily, yeah, yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, you can be in the so, yeah. Thanks, yeah, yeah, so, sorry for that. All right, uh, can you see my screen there? I'll try to be relatively fast. Um, all right, so I'll be talking about merging real-time optimization uh, and machine learning. So my research group does many things. Uh, well, not, yeah. Uh, and today I'll be talking about real-time optimization, uncertainty, and probably process integration if I have, have a bit of time. So the outline is I'll talk about what real-time optimization is, then I'll talk about how we can merge it with Bayesian optimization, and then how we add techniques from optimization theory with, from mathematical programming, such as trust regions, to robustify approach. So to use actually machine learning in engineering applications, which is not uh, super straightforward in many cases. And then I'll talk about uh, process optimization. So anyway, first I'll talk about what, what we call real-time optimization. So for this, so I'm a chemical engineer, so I'll just show a reactor as case study, but this can be in general any system. So let's assume that we want to optimize some reactor. So we want to optimize our, our product and we want to move around basically some inflow rate and some temperature so that we optimize our product. So just for nomenclature, I'm just gonna be calling my inputs U The idea is that in real-time optimization, we call the plant our real system. So the plant can be a reactor, the plant can be some aircraft, the plant can be anything. It's just the way that we call our real system. And how do we optimize a real system in, in a real-time optimization framework? Well, we pose an optimization problem where we have some performance index. So again, the case of the reactor, it might be you want to increase production or you want to increase the productivity versus how much uh, energy it costs. So you have a performance index, which you want to maximize. Then you have some plant constraints. And again, these are super important in any engineering application. So almost all engineering applications, you need to have constraints, particularly for safety. Um, and what's more interesting is most in most problems, the solution will be at one of these constraints, uh, which is why they're super important. Then you want to have the plant dynamics. So by plant dynamics, what I mean is simply this little diagram that I have here, I'm putting in a mathematical form where it takes inputs U and the plant, it maps the plant dynamics to my outputs Y. And then I have some input bounds. So this is, let's say my torque. So I cannot give lots of temp, like infinite amount of temperature or remove an infinite amount of heat from a reactor. I cannot press an infinite amount of acceleration or deceleration in an aircraft and so on. And the idea here, and this is a key thing, is that I've, I've used Y superscript here to represent that this means the plant. So this means that this is the actual output from my real system. And I'm making that emphasis because when I do model-based optimization, the problem is exactly the same but with one key difference. And that is that here, again, the output is from my plant, so from my real system. And here the output is from a model. Yeah, so this is some simulation that we do and we use an optimization. And generally this, well, this is always parameterized by some parameters, yeah? And the, and the key idea is that we always have plant model mismatch. So no matter what model you do, if it's a machine learning model, if it's a knowledge-based model, Again, for engineering applications, the most powerful are those that combine both. Uh, but you will always have still plant model mismatch. Yeah? So your model will never be correct. Generally, we call structural plant model mismatch where you have where the structure of your model is wrong. And this is always the case again, like when you have friction, uh, when you have a bit of wind that you're not taking into account, or in reactions when you have intermediate reactions and so on. So what's the main idea? So the main idea is that generally we have some, some starting point where we want to optimize and we have the real plants optimum and our models optimum. Now, I mean, for those of us that, that, are, that are familiar with models and with optimization, generally when you're using a model and this model has some mismatch, if you optimize it, the, the errors are gonna be magnified. And the key point here is that 
I'm assuming that uh, this uh, circles, white circles, I'm actually sampling my true system. I'm actually getting samples from my system. And I'm trying to re-estimate the parameters. But even then, your, your, your optimum will be wrong. And this is something that is counterintuitive. So even if you're re trying to do regression on your real system in real time, you get to the wrong optimum. And this is not only a mathematical, you can only prove it mathematically, but this is, you can also prove it with many examples. And the idea is that we devise an algorithm that actually notices this and actually goes back. Uh, as you get samples, it notices this and it goes to the plant cell. So what's generally done right now? So let's assume that we have a model. And again, this is the, the standard approach that people use. So you have a model and you assume that you have just some parameters. Yeah, I'm just putting this a chemical reaction, but again, this can be anything. And these are your models and this is the optimization problem that you want to solve. And then what you do is you have, again, some starting point. You collect some data on the ongoing system. Again, this is real-time optimization. And you reparameterize your system. So you try to fit your current uh, model to, to, to new data. Then you do an optimization step. And then you, you involve this data point into your data. You re-optimize the parameter. You optimize again. Again, re-estimate parameters. Optimize again. Re-estimate parameters. Optimize again and re-estimate. And again, even when you're connecting, collecting real-time data, you're actually going to be off from the real plants optimum. And this is complicated because you don't even know it. Yeah. Uh, and, this is, and this can be even, so this is even more magnified when you have constraints. So you might be going to violate that constraint without actually knowing it. Anyway, so what is our approach that we're doing? So the idea is that, again, we have our original problem. We have our plant optimization here. And what we want to do is we want to have a function here. So we want to embed a function into our optimization problem. And what, what we want this function to do is to be able to, to, to have the, the mismatch between my plant and my model. So the mismatch between my real system and my model. And that's why I, what I want this little term to do. And the idea and how I do this is, why do I want this? Well, I see that. Uh, the model terms cancel out, and I'm left only with my plant system. But the idea is how do I manage to get this little function that, and that can actually predict the error between my plant and my model? And here's where machine learning comes in, and the magic is on Gaussian processes. Yeah? So if you remember, uh, if, you, if you don't know Gaussian processes, just a quick, a quick uh, explaining. Let's assume that we have data, and this data comes from measurement errors between the mismatch between a plant and my model, I can fit some regression. And if I were just to use a regression, let's say some neural network, then for a, X, from a, for a new X point, I get a new Y predicted point. But the idea is I also want to have a, a, an uncertainty. So I also want to know how much of I can be outside of the points. So I see that where I have taken measurements, my uncertainty is actually low. And away from them, it's actually high. And then for every new prediction that I want to make, I actually get a distribution. And this is very useful because then you not only make a prediction, but you can also know how uncertain you are about the prediction. And again, this is crucial in engineering applications because of safety, safety concerns. So the idea is that we add a Gaussian process, and then we add some other techniques that are called trust regions again. This comes from the mathematical programming uh, community. And what we managed to do is we managed to have a, a nice algorithm, which again, this would be model's wrong optimum, and it manages to see that it's going the wrong way, and it finds the, 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 the correct optimum here. And not only that, but we have these trust regions. So these little circles that you see are trust regions, where our, our, we don't have a controller to move the models. And not only that, but at the end, at converges, it actually shrinks to zero. And that's the way that we actually know it has converged, and we reached our true optimum. So again, this also happens when we have constraints. And the nice thing is, again, this algorithm is a robust constraint violation. And this is, this is crucial in things where you have aircraft, reactor, or we actually have real, real people. So this is just a diagram of what the Gaussian process sees. So again, at the beginning, our predictions are very uncertain. But as more iterations become available, then a better model starts to develop. And the idea is that each of these iterations is itself a complex problem, so we have to do a Bayesian optimization. So what we have to do is we have to combine evolutionary algorithms to themselves optimize our Gaussian process, and then we use a combination of evolutionary 
and gradient-based algorithms to solve uh, our, our real-time optimization problem. And just a, a quick, uh, quick thing. So we've not only used this in real-time optimization, but also, for example, to optimize complex flow sheets. So we have a very, very big problem, or I work in bioprocesses, also biorefineries. You can split it up in many parts. And actually what you can have is many of these little algorithms linked together, almost as if, as, as if you want to have like multi-agents. Uh, and this is what the work that we're doing. This is work with Edgar Sanchez, which is also uh, here in Ria, one of the organizers. And that's basically it. Uh, so thanks to my friends and collaborators. And again, one key detail that I want to give up is that when you actually want to address many engineering applications, it's not only machine learning that does the magic, but also knowledge from models and from engineering and from, and from control. And merging both of them is, is ideal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. This was um, very nice uh, to hear. So we're just going to take uh, one question uh, from the audience um, while Pilar uh, starts uh, preparing her, her presentation. Um, so a quick question that we had, Antonio, for, from you is, uh, people found her inspiring your trajectory. Um, can you share a little bit about what you think uh, helped you win the award of the best PhD thesis? Um, let me just copy and paste the, their question um, here. So uh, we got this from the social media that we're streaming um, your your talk. So could you just talk a little bit about what you think helped you um, like win all of these awards um, and get this recognition? I think it's a lot about, and I mean, probably I'm going to say what everyone says, but enjoying your work is a big, big part of it. Uh, so, so, so yeah, being able to enjoy what you do, being, being able to work with also other people that are super brilliant and intelligent uh, helps a lot. So I, I, I think that I think that like, if you enjoy your work, you're gonna do it better. You don't, you're not gonna feel like it's work. And be people have discussions, just friendly discussions help a lot. So I think that would be my, my, my like one or two pieces of advice to enjoy it and to work with people even if it's not working on a project but um yeah, but like being able to talk to friends and people who enjoy the same things you do thank you um so so Pilar, we have for, here, uh, for Pilar, uh, some... but we have sometimes it's sorry sorry to interrupt this she could send you the slides uh oh. side, and then you could present for her maybe oh okay okay, uh, okay. It can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I had problem with my computer. Then I tried to go to my iPad, and it's keeping me that I cannot share the presentation. I don't know. The screen share is not supported by the browser, or is something that you have to allow a permission. I, I think that we uh, have. Um, I, I think that maybe we need to move some of the speakers that are involved. Or what? 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 What do you recommend, Antonio? I, I think it's a problem with the sharing okay. itself. It, it happened. It happened sometime. Uh, okay. Later on. But I, I think it's not. It's not a number of speakers because because yeah. I can share okay. it. Okay. I, I think okay. Pilar, what yeah. is, if you can send your slide to Saif or, or to me or to anyone, and we can share. That's what we did another time. It worked. Oh, okay. And how should I uh, share that with you? I think that I emailed you um, about this panel, so you could email them to me, and I'll just share them. Oh, okay. So anyway, okay, yeah, I'm going to email it to you. Um, feel, feel free to email Antonio. Who, whoever, um, either me or, or Antonio should work. Uh, or, or me. <laughs> oh, that's sounds, okay, <laughs> let me just open the, uh, the mail, and I will mail it to you. This is Sorry, um, while while Pilar is, uh, is is sending us that, I'm I'm going to uh, say a little. I'll, I'm going to share her bio. Um, so Pilar is uh, currently um, uh, a main researcher at the Instituto Nacional de Astrofísica, Optica y Electrónica (INAUE). Um, she has basic and applied research in artificial neural networks and other learning machines um, used for temporal classification and prediction. She is a leader and or collaborator with projects that tackle problems related to brain computer interfaces. Wow, that's very interesting. Forecasting for finances, uh, data mining, and classification of brain signals. 
Um, so Pilar is working a lot around brain-computer interfaces. That's very interesting. She is a member of the Mexican Academy of Computing, where she coordinates the Signal Analysis and Pattern Recognition Academy, Academic Section. She is a senior IEEE member. Um, she also uh, is uh, the founder of Mexico's uh, chapter in, our, in um, Computational Intelligence and Society of the IEEE. Um, she also is a founder of uh, Puebla's uh, Sociedad de Instrumentación y Medidas of the IEEE, and she's also a member of the uh, ACM. Um, and so, Pilar, that's a very uh, inspiring work, and I think it's also very nice to hear about how you have been uh, planting seeds um, to really see these, uh, these wide range of areas grow, uh, for, for instance, in particular, the brain-computer interfaces uh, in Mexico. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Sage, for this nice presentation. Uh, I think I have mailed to you these slides. Okay, to me. Uh, um, okay. Let's see. Meanwhile, I can start talking if you don't uh, mind. Uh, I haven't received them. You haven't? Um, yeah, and okay. let me, I should probably, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. I am um, yeah, so let me uh, add to stream. Sorry about that. I'm back. Uh, sorry to our YouTubers. Oh, we ha we hear uh, somebody saying that. Do you guys hear in in YouTube? Some people are saying that you can't hear. Um, do did does this work? Do do people hear? So I have not received um your presentation. Let me. You cannot hear me. Uh, no, sorry, on YouTube somebody said that, but I think that it was more my stream. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Now they, they said that it's working. It's working. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I am. Did you get these slides or I can mail it to uh, Enrique? Or you can email me, them to me if not to see if I, if I can get them, Pilar. Oh, okay. Just uh, let me check here. And. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I have. They are going. Okay. Let's see if uh, some of you can get it. Uh, um, I am mailing oh, that to Enrique, it. and I got it. You got it. Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> Sorry about that. I I don't know what's going on. It seems that uh, the computer didn't didn't want me to to give a talk today. <laughs> I had been fighting with that the whole day. <laughs> okay. Well, meanwhile, you get the presentations. Uh, the the I mean the slides. Uh, let me talk just a little about. I come from the Inaue, as it was already told, and uh, today's uh, talk is going to be about the um, use of EEG for classification. Then um, this is something that uh, uh, it's very popular now uh, because of the interest in uh, trying to read our minds. Then uh, maybe I can uh, tell you, say, if to go to the to the next, then you can uh, we can follow. Please go to the next. Yeah. Okay, uh, I am the machine learning and pattern recognition uh, lab, and these are some of my colleagues. Next, um, something very important is that I am related to three areas, uh, signal processing, uh, pattern recognition, and artificial neural networks. And as just Antonio said, it's very important to, to be able to handle all of these uh, basic in, uh, concepts in other areas. Uh, next, please. Um, the question that everybody has is, it is possible to read minds, and in our case, using electroencephalograms. Next. Uh, the short answer to that is that it is, but in a very limited way yet. Uh, some very popular use of classification is related now to brain computer interfaces, identity verification, uh, identification of emotions, concentration levels, fatigue, 
Um, and in the health area, it is also very popular, try to predict uh, seizures. And to do so, also, it's used the identification of preictal or ictal states. It is also very popular today, the mindful, uh, the, the use of EEGs for training mindfulness or for physiotherapy. Next. Uh, with respect to, to the BCI, uh, the most popular are the ones that are invasive. This is an article just past year related to uh, uh, this, uh, BCI, uh, Brain Computer Interface, for people who cannot move. Next. Dr. Anderson was the creator of uh, these systems, one of the most popular systems, which was uh, the first time that a patient was able to move an arm, a robot arm, was in 2013. Uh, this is a very useful uh, way to do it. But as you can see in the picture, this is uh, the input, the input signals come uh, from sensors embedded into the cortex area. Next, please. Uh, this is, um, as we all know, that um, a classifier is made of these parts, signal acquisition, preprocessing, feature extraction, recognition, and decision making. Next, please. What happens what happened with, uh, with EEG? Well, our main problem here goes around preprocessing and feature extraction. Preprocessing is, is a challenge and feature extraction is an even bigger challenge. Next, please. Uh, the idea uh, behind that is that uh, um, noise comes from everywhere. Then the, the, the detection levels that we might have, uh, the input can be detected from outside the, the cortex as a EEG or with embedded uh, devices, as is in the case of the ECOG or intercollector recordings. And next, please. Uh, what we do in my, in my lab all is just using non-invasive input devices. We, we don't have any, any research with, uh, with um, real patients, let's say. And what we do is you, we concentrate on the algorithms. Then we, we use a lot of uh, database already uh, taken from other places, and we also took, take our own signals. Next, please. We are very concentrated on trying to get information in BCIs and trying to uh, do it with low cost devices as the epoch uh, that I just showed. Therefore, we, we face the key issues of machine learning in a very particular way here. Uh, you, we all know that this has to do with how to represent the data, how to get efficient optimization of the algorithms that we are having. And very important part is how we really get an efficient evaluation of the models that we are getting in order to make them available, I mean, useful in, in real world. Next. Um, I am going just to talk about um, two, two applications. Well, before that, let me just say one word about visual extraction. Uh, this is the critical issue. And in our research, we combine, we use both uh, main ways that are the classical signal processing algorithms as um, fast Fourier transforms and uh, uh, wavelets and all of that. And we are also trying to use deep neural networks, not only the convolutional neural networks, but also other class recurrent neural networks in order to be able to obtain a good representation because that's the main problem with CNN. This is a two-dimensional uh, input, and everything uh, depends on how do you put the input to the data, to the network. Next, please. 
Uh, we have had a very interesting uh, results with very simple networks as this recurrent wavelet network, which is uh, based on wavelets. And um, what we did here was to uh, predict the state of, uh, of a patient, a uh, uh, patient that suffers from epilepsy. And the idea is to predict the interictal states, which are a, a preamble to the attack. Then this is very, very popular uh, to, to build devices to, to help people with epilepsy. Uh, next, please. Um, the, well, uh, uh, at the end, you will see the, you can find these uh, publications in my, in my web page, and I will have also available in the, um, um, in my web page, these slides, then you can see them and you can see the references. Some other uh, interesting uh, results that we have is using the CNN networks for identification of cognitive loads. Uh, this is an interesting combination. What we are doing is we are feeding the CNN with a two-dimensional representation, which was created by somebody else. But what we did was to include in the CNN uh, two layers that allow the network to get better the information related to the temporal relationship into the time series. And these are the residual blocks and the recurrent uh, layers. Um, next, please. Some other uh, very important uh, thing that we face when we work with, cla with classification of EEGs is that uh, most of them are done for a particular patient by a particular subject. And if you want to use it with somebody else, then you have to retrain the model. And that is very costly. And normally, we don't have enough data to do so. Then um, these last two couple of years, we have been working with a model for domain adaptation. Uh, using transfer learning and other techniques to be able to have a model trained in one subject and then try to adjust that model to transfer to be able to recognize data from, from another object, a target object. Uh, the algorithms to do that um, are getting very good results in the uh, benchmark databases. And we just got that published in the in the IEEE signal processing letter. Um, next, please. Well, this is a very, very fast. It's just telling you very, very simple what we are doing. But I invited you to go to our web page and look for the for the publications. And I just want to 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 uh, highlight three important things. There is a lot of uh, hope now in being able to get better EEG classifiers because we have a very a much powerful computational machines, not mine, as you can see, but we still have many very good computational machines. We have algorithms and we have the ability to, to, to get much better results with very traditional algorithms and with new ones. And that's very important. We need for, to, look, to go to the theory and look for better algorithms, not just to use the ones that are popular now. And the third thing that I think is very important to consider in our research in this area is that good programming techniques are a must. The reuse of software is so important that we cannot really uh, support to have errors. And um, it's uh, important also to realize that the on, uh, to honor the cause of ethics is mandatory in these areas. Uh, next, please. Well, uh, this is um, all that I want to tell you now. Um, maybe I can just uh, leave for a little the, present the presentation there. And uh, this is my web page and my my mail. Then please feel free to, to write to me, then I can 
mail you the presentation or or we can talk a little more about these applications. Uh, thank you, Safe. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think that I stopped sharing. Uh, do you guys see my video again? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So um, let's take really quickly some questions uh, for Pilar. Uh, and we're just going to take also some, I'm just going to read out loud some of the questions that Monica shared, um, the answers, because um, they were asked from social media. Um, so Pilar, somebody, um, Pedro, um, Pe Pe well, Pe Pedro, I, I, sorry, Pedro, I can't pronounce your last name. Um, Pedro is asking if you could share a little bit about um, what, his, what should he study if he wants to get involved in, uh, in making these brain interfaces? Um, is it studying uh, computer engineering, signal processing? Um, what is a pathway uh, to get involved in this area? Uh, okay, that's a very good question. The main issues go around signal processing, which means mathematics, and well, computer science in the area of uh, programming and data structures. Uh, then what I recommend is to, to get a bachelor even in electrical engineering or computer science. Both of them might have the, the basic concepts related to signal processing and, comp and uh, programming and to data structures. And very, very important to have the math basics related to, to, to these areas. Uh, and some other important thing is to go to the, if you are going to use machine learning, just understand very well the algorithms for training and optimization. And um, because many times the errors that you can find are very, very, very hidden. It's not easy to recognize. Then if you don't have a good programming preparation, that is really a pain. Then I recommend the, the computer science area and electrical engineering in any order, maybe a master and a bachelor or the other way around. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you all of the panelists for their amazing presentations. Um, I think that we have a little bit, few minutes left. So what I'm going to do is uh, feel free. So for the people that are watching us on social media, feel free to start uh, sharing more of your questions that you have. I'm going to start reading uh, some of uh, the questions that we had and you can feel free to also jump in. So um, to Monica, uh, a person was asking on social media if she could talk a little bit about what were the differences between designing for people with disabilities uh, across countries. Um, I don't know, Monica, if you want to share what you put on the, on the chat or, um, or, or I can also read it. Yeah, um, so I think for me it is how much support each individual with autism has had in the past and how much stimulation she, he has had. So for example, in Mexico, the Mexican law just uh, recognized autism, didn't recognize autism as a disorder. With, that means that public schools and public healthcare institutions does, did, did not have the obligation to provide an early intervention program to support the children. So all parents and individuals with autism in Mexico hardly had early stimulation before six or seven years old when they get into elementary school. In contrast with the states that they, it is mandatory to do an assessment at 12 months old, at 12 months and 18 months old. And immediately after there's a red flag, they are put into an early inter intervention program. So if you compare an individual with autism from Mexico which is seven years old, he might not be verbal, he might not talk, and he may have the age, the age level or age development of uh, three years old. Whereas in the States, they had the early intervention program, they might talk and they might be more, you know, aligned with their neurotypical peers. Um, so that's, that's, that's why it's very different. So if you are designing for, you know, individual with autism in Mexico, they might be heavily delayed compared to their neurotypical peers. And we, the main goal for us is to kind of level up the age functioning level with their developmental level. And um, so, so that is why it's, it's, it's kind of different. 
Thank you. Uh, so it seems that a lot of policy, uh, it, it really does matter in terms of uh, the type of treatment that um, these, pa this, these different patients uh, can receive. Um, we had a, a question for Pilar related to, um, P for Pilar and actually also Mo Monica, um, if they could talk a little bit about how they saw human computer interaction, UX, uh, influencing brain uh, computer interfaces. Uh, sorry, Sophie, I couldn't hear you uh, very well. Could you say oh, again? Sorry. Um, so, uh, some, uh, a person on social media is asking uh, if you could discuss a little bit about how UX, uh, human computer interaction, uh, could help uh, the brain interfaces that, you're, that, 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 that you are designing, um, if it could help. Uh, okay, well, I can answer first and then the Monica. Um, yeah, it might help. The human computer interfaces um, are as a very in, very useful ways to communicate. Then, when when, when you have a, when you wanted to, uh, for example, I don't know if the, if this is what uh, he or she is referring to, but when you have a, a interface uh, that uh, require that when you cannot move your muscles then uh, for any reason, because you are being something else or because you, you, you have some health problem, then obviously you need to do such uh, communication in some way with computer. Then the, the brain computer interfaces are a human interface. Uh, but I don't know if, if he or she was uh, talking about that. Uh, or I yeah. don't know if Monica wants to add something. Yeah, I think, you know, I would like to answer that question with an example. I will always say to my students, you know, if there's something that, you know, in in technic in a technical area you cannot solve, just ask them, like ask them to do something and they will be doing that. So I, I'm going to give you an example. So I had one project of brain computer interfaces with children with autism. And as you can see, brain computer interfaces are, are heavily noise, right? So they, if you move, then you add some noise into the signal and you are not reading, you know, information that is, uh, that is fruitful or that you can actually use. Um, so what we do is with the interface, we ask them to kind of maintain eye contact in a specific part of the screen. And so, and we just said to them, we would just prompt them, stop moving, right? And um, so that kind of helped to alleviate that issue of adding noise into the data we were reading from brain computer interfaces. So this is a very particular example and a very, you know, simple uh, solution to a very big, a huge problem. But yeah, uh, I mean, if you can prompt them and, you know, give them feedback of what they can do and how can, make easier the interaction with this kind of technologies, I think that, that might help. Thank you. Um, then I'm just gonna take one, uh, like I'm gonna take really, uh, I think I'm thinking that we have time for one more or what, what do you think? That's fine, whatever you want. <laughs> um, okay, let's take one for, uh, so, the, so to uh, Enrique Sucar, they were asking, um, do you know if uh, probabilistic graphical models can be uh, applied to supply chain optimization, uh, for example, biofuels, refineries, or any other integrated supply chains? Um, I think that you responded in the chat, but I'm just uh, replying so that others can maybe learn a little bit about, um, and maybe you can discuss a little bit about the best applications that you think a uh, probabilistic graphical model should be used for. Yes, uh, yes, I answered something. Uh, oh, I think you muted. I, or, oh, sorry. Can oh, you no, hear me? I, I muted you. I muted you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so, yes, uh, well, I, I think uh, there could be applications in supply chains. Uh, I think uh, basically maybe markup decision processes, because there you want to kind of optimize your decisions. Uh, I, I don't know much about that domain, but. Uh, I, I imagine that macro decision processes uh, in these kind of applications, if you want to take good decisions and you have uncertainty, could be applied. I think in general, graphical models, uh, for instance, are, are useful in applications in, you, in which you have some prior knowledge. 
also in which some kind of interpretability is important. Uh, so, for instance, medical applications, or I think uh, student modeling, for instance, in intelligent tutors, that was a, an area in which they have been applied a lot. Uh, and uh, also in areas like supply chains or uh, robotics, in which you want to take a decision from the uncertainty, there is quite related to reinforcement learning, uh, but I think in this area also. No? And, and I, I can make just a, a brief commercial in, in my book. I have like a 30 different applications of graphical models. <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm actually really excited about seeing that book. Um, it looks fantastic. Um, so we all need to get that book from Enrique Sukar. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we have like, let's just take one last question for Antonio. Uh, so this is, this is also coming from uh, social media. Um, I hope I, I have to type it in um, like ma manually because I have, I'm seeing it on this computer. Um, so, Antonio, uh, what do you think is needed to improve the curriculum in Mexico for having more research in AI plus chemistry? Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's difficult to say. I think many things, but so I think more, more about showing engineers and chemists and biologists how to program. And I actually think we're not that far away. I've seen that Mexican curriculum and actually Mexican professors and researchers, they are involving lots of programming into like engineers, biologists, chemists. Uh, so I, I, I actually don't think we're that far away. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I think the curriculum, I, I think that's the way to go. I also think moving away from maths is a very bad idea. Uh, I know some universities at some point suggested it, but then others said, like, no, this is not happening. So I think those are the main, even if you don't do math or only programming, like having both of them is going to be super important. And it's always super important, I think. I, again, I'm not an expert, so I'm sure, yeah, Enrique, Pilar, and Monica have, have probably better points. Yes, I, I just want to add uh, that uh, even going earlier, like uh, uh, teaching, uh, for instance, computational thinking at high school level. Yeah. So people yeah. uh, start uh, thinking about uh, computing algorithms in, in, other, in all areas. Actually, this can be applied in all areas. So teaching younger in high school, that could be, a, I think, a way to, to improve. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I would like to add something. Uh, I think the problem is not in the bachelor degree. I think the problem is in the basic degrees. I mean, the basic education, primary education. People is forgetting about that to understand the basic of mathematics is important. We are, sadly, we are getting students that are not able to understand the very basic things about arithmetic even or algebra. And uh, that creates a big problem because how can you understand um, calculus if you are not able to understand uh, um, algebra? Then the, this is what is happening in Mexico, sadly. We need to go to the basic education in mathematics and enforce that. Yeah, and I think, and I think what I would like to add as well is that I don't think they understand what computer science is actually is. I mean, they think that because they program a web page or because they use uh, blue jeans or Zoom or whatever, I mean, oh, I, I know computer. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, you can use a computer that's not necessarily computer science. Um, so I think that's another huge problem. They think they do computer science and they actually do not know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And maybe also with uh, like all of the schools of programming that have emerged, um, that it's not, uh, for a lot of students, it's not clear that maybe those schools are very technical and they're not thinking you like to, to apply broadly, which, which is something that maybe computer science and computer engineering is teaching you to do. Um, well, thank you all very much. I think that this was a very uh, inspiring panel uh, to hear about Enrique, 
uh, Antonio, uh, Pilar, and, and, and Monica. I really like that it was a range of different areas and just really nice to see uh, all of the great work uh, that is happening in Latin America and also uh, from people, um, from Mexicans living abroad, um, like Antonio. Thanks to Thanks you. Thank you. Thank you.